Welcome to the ACE Project, brought to you by the Literacy.io team at Texas A&M University. I'm your host, Ashley Stack, also known as Captain Comprehension. We are so excited you'll be joining us on this reading journey and hope you and your child enjoy this time together. So get comfy, rev up your brains, and get ready to think, because we are ready to help you become a comprehension detective. Hi there, super readers. My name is Captain Comprehension, and I am here to guide you as you become a comprehension detective. Welcome to week 27 of our podcast. We will not be doing any texting surveys during our summer podcasts. So this month, please enjoy hearing Balderdash, John Newberry and the boisterous birth of children's books. Today, we'll be reading about a very important man. His name is John Newberry. Do you enjoy reading your favorite book series? It's so wonderful to have books available for kids your age, but it was not always this way. Newberry lived in a time, 1726 to be exact, where children did not have books written for them. Books were only for adults. This caused a problem, but listen closely to see how John Newberry changed this issue. Before we begin, let's go over some important vocabulary. Our first term is bustling. Bustling means full of activity. A synonym or word that means the same might be busy, hectic, or lively. And an antonym or opposite would be deserted, quiet, or calm. Next we have the term champion. A champion is someone who fights for a cause on behalf of somebody else. A synonym or word that means the same might be advocate or supporter and an antonym could be opponent or critic. All right, it's time for us to read the story. I hope you enjoy Balderdash. Welcome, this book's for you. Every page, every picture, every word, and even its letters are designed for your pleasure. Lucky, lucky reader, be glad it's not 1726. In those days of powdered wigs and petticoats, England was brimming with books. Books of pirates and monsters and miniature people. Tales of travels and quests and shipwrecks and crimes. At the fairs, in the market stalls, in the bookshop windows were hundreds of wonderful books. But not for children. Oh no! Children had to read preachy poems and fables, religious texts that made them fear that death was near, and manuals that told them where to stand, how to sit, not to laugh, and scores of other rules. Because the future champion of children's books was just a lad. His name was John Newberry. The boy lived on a farm, but fancied reading more than forking hay, so upon coming of age, he set off to work for a printer. John got a kick out of type sticks and type stands and chases and coins. He came to love galleys and presses and the smell of fresh ink. As soon as he was able, John became a publisher himself. Then he went big time. He moved to London, center of the book-selling trade. Smack dab in the heart of the book marketplace in St. Paul's churchyard, he found a place for a store. Brilliant! The streets were bustling with tradesmen, doctors, lawyers, clerks, and many other eager readers. John wanted to publish fine books for the whole lot of them and for their children. He knew the youngsters were hungry for stories. Many boys and girls handed coppers to street hawkers for ugly chapbooks of fairy tales or for chopped up versions of grown up books. John liked children. Why shouldn't they have delightful books of their own? John, what were you thinking? What about the parents? Many mums and dads worried that if their little nippers read fun books, they'd turn wild as beasts. Balderdash! Reading should be a treat for children. That's what a famous philosopher wrote, and John agreed. So did two other publishers. One issued a book with alphabet rhymes and well-known stories, and the other printed itty-bitty books about animals, plants, and local buildings. 
John wanted his first book for children to be irresistible. There'd be letters from Jack the Giant Killer. There'd be pictures of pitch and hustle, hoop and hide, blind man's buff, and other children's games. Plus, ABCs, Proverbs, and other classic material, and for an extra punch, a message to mums and dads. He ordered gilt floral paper for the covers and titled his creation A Little Pretty Pocketbook. Price of book alone, six pence, with a ball or pin cushion, eight pence, the notice read. A book and a toy? Why hadn't anyone else thought of that? Then John set his bright books in the window of his store and wondered, will the parents buy them? Are they too cheerful? The children gobbled them up like plum cakes. John thought if they liked fun, attractive books, they'd probably like a magazine, too. Grown-ups read magazines. Why shouldn't children? A magazine with rhymes, riddles, recipes, stories, adorned with crisp copper plate engravings. Working in the back of his bookshop or chatting with his chums in the tavern, John's mind bubbled with more ideas. For older children, he printed books about arithmetic, geography, astronomy, and other subjects, including one taught by a pretend boy philosopher named Tom Telescope. Then John came up with his most ingenious product for youngsters yet, a novel. Grown-ups were reading novels, why shouldn't the little masters and ladies? One long, luscious story to savor for several days. The History of Little Goody Two-Shoes is about a raggedy orphan who is left to wander the roads. Despite many misfortunes, the girl betters herself. She carves her own alphabet blocks and teaches poor children. She strolls around with a dog, a lamb, and various birds that she has rescued and educated. Ralph, her pet raven, even writes poems. Though she starts off penniless, Goody ends up marrying a country squire rich enough to own a coach and six. A coach and six? In those days, that was like riding in a luxury car. Goody went from rags to riches without a fairy godmother. She did it through study, hard work, and kindness. You can too, the book was saying, and John believed it. Goody Two Shoes became a smash hit, both in England and across the ocean in America. To this day, its author is a mystery. All the books John published for his little friends, as he called the young readers, were written anonymously or by people with silly made-up names. Another of John's books was about a tumultuous fair, and its dedication was signed, You Know Who. But everyone knew who. Who else had a shop that sold ABC books, gift books, books about Tom Thumb and Giles Gingerbread, books of jokes and riddles, books of science, history, and geography that were loved so hard, that were thumbed so often, they came apart at the spine? Who else sold thousands of copies, inspiring other publishers to start making delightful books for young people? John Newberry, the father of children's literature. Huzzah! The grand design in the nurture of children is to make them strong, hearty, healthy, virtuous, wise, and happy. John Newberry, from A Little Pretty Pocketbook. I hope you enjoyed reading that story, Super Readers. As you are reading, were you thinking about the text structure of Balderdash? Here were some of the clues that I heard. Books were not for children. Newberry was inspiring. Kids were hungry for books. They loved the books he did. And here we have that word inspiring again. It just kept repeating. The kids were eager readers. So was there a problem? Was it solved? Were there two or more things being compared? Hmm. Use your text structure bookmark to try and figure out the text structure of Balderdash. You can pause your video and discuss it with your adult partner. But remember, during the summer months, we will not use the texting survey. Welcome back, Super Readers. It's time for us to identify the text structure so we can write our main idea. 
The text structure for Balderdash was cause, problem, and solution. So we can use the sentence stems, the cause is, the problem is, and the solution is. Pause your videos and jot down what you think the main idea for this story was. When you're ready, press play to see what I wrote. Hey super readers, here's my main idea for Balderdash. The cause is books were being created and published for adults. The problem is that there were no books for children. The solution is that John Newberry began publishing and selling books for children. All right, it's time for us to answer a multiple choice main idea question. What is the best main idea of the selection? A. It was the year 1726 and books were being shared throughout the world. B. John Newberry decided to publish books for children and sell his books with toys at his little bookshop in London. The toys helped him sell more books. C. John Newberry's books were compared to the books of his day by the people who can buy and read those books. Or D. Books used to be for adults, but not for children. However, John Newberry solved this by publishing and selling books for children. Pause your video and discuss what you think the answer might be with your adult partner. Welcome back, super readers. You are doing a fantastic job, so let's write a summary. Let's revisit our main idea first. The cause is books are being created and published for adults. The problem is that there were no books for children. The solution is that John Newberry began publishing and selling books for children. So think about some details that you can add to the cause, some details you might add to the problem, and some details you could add to the solution to extend your main idea into a summary. Pause your videos, discuss it with your adult partner, and when you're ready, press play to see what I wrote. Hey there, detectives. Here's what I wrote for my summary. The cause is years ago, books were being created and published for adults. The problem is that there were no books for children. Children could only read poems, fables, and religious texts. The solution is that John Newberry began publishing and selling books for children. Newberry opened a bookstore in London where he inspired other publishers to publish more books for children too. Okay, it's time for us to answer a multiple choice summary question. Remember, you're going to try to identify the answer that contains the cause, the problem, and the solution with a few added details in it. What is the best summary of the selection? A. John Newberry loved the type sticks, chases, and type stands in his new job working for a printer. He loved presses and the smell of fresh ink. B. England had books everywhere, but children had to read old religious texts, poems, and manuals. John Newberry decided to move to London, opened a bookstore, and published children's books. Newberry inspired other publishers to also publish for children. C. In London, the streets were filled with doctors, lawyers, tradesmen, and clerks. These people were eager readers, including the children of these individuals. John wanted letters from Jack the Giant Killer, various other exciting books, and even wanted to include a note to the parents in the books. D. Children tried to get books from street hawkers and pieces of the books adults read. A famous philosopher shared how reading should be an enjoyable treat for the children. Pause the video and discuss which one you think is the best summary for this text. You're doing great work, detectives. It's time for us to infer. Remember, when we infer, we take clues from what we've read, we add it together with what we already have in our brains, and we draw a conclusion or make an inference. If you lived during this time as a child, how would you feel that most of the books were for adults only? Who can the reader infer the author of John Newberry's books, like Goody Two-Shoes, might be? Pause that video and discuss these questions with your adult partner now. Thank you so much for joining us this week, Comprehension Detectives. I hope you enjoyed reading about John Newberry and his important role in creating books for children. I look forward to joining you again next month. Remember, we can all be super readers. This is Captain Comprehension. Signing off.